Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Just to correct a few things, I'm a part-time tutor and lecturer, not full-time. Not full-time there yet. All right. OK, I know I have 20 minutes, and so I'm going to get straight into the presentation. I'm going to take you on a gendered journey. So I'm going to look at this whole concept of masculinity and what is happening in schools and so on through a gendered lens. Masculinity, the title of my paper, give it a title, Masculinity as Performance, Schools Out. And I go to my opening quote, which sets the stage. For many men, meeting the demands of a male gender identity is a far greater moral imperative than the virtues of honesty and respect for property and even life. By, well, he's now deceased, Professor Barry Chavans out of Mona. And the crux of my presentation will focus on construction of the male gender identity, and I'm identifying that as lying at the heart of this whole debate about boys underachievement, underperforming, underparticipation. So this presentation will begin by focusing on the various models of masculinities with the aim of arriving at a working definition of this concept that we refer to as masculinity. It must be borne in mind that there's no one monolithic unitary category that we call masculinity. We need to change that and talk about masculinities that spans a spectrum, a continuum. Okay, so we need to bear that in mind. It must be borne in mind that such a concept, defining such a concept, according to scholars like Plummer, and David Plummer was a professor, a visiting professor here some, some years ago, he has admitted that this defining masculinity is, is admittedly a difficult thing to do. I will then focus on the construction of Caribbean masculinities in terms of the behaviors, attitudes, and values and define them and how these in turn impact upon the performance of boys in schools and school system. So, defining the concept of masculinity. Masculinity are, are those aspects of men's behavior which fluctuate from time to time, a concept which only exists in relation to femininity. I need to pause and stress that without, there's no masculinity without femininity. Men, us men, we define ourselves in relation to what what femininity is. So men is men are what femininity isn't. So men go to the other end of the spectrum. So we need to, to remember that gender relations, so human relations, and one place of the other. So if there was no femininity, there would be no masculinity because we would not have anything to define ourselves from and compare ourselves to. And that's one of the issues that we do as well. We tend to compare boys with girls and so on. We get into that, into that world, which is something we need to avoid. But more on that later. Okay, so um, in other words, masculinity as a concept is not ahistorical, but rather rooted and grounded in a particular cultural space in a given time and space and consequently always subject to change. So whatever models of masculinity we, we presently are witnessing, they can be edited. It's important to know that many scholars, as I said before, speak about masculinity as opposed to one masculinity which they all contend do not exist. In fact, one scholar referred to masculinity as collective hallucination, something that all of us men aspire to, but doesn't really exist. It's all in our imagination. In essence, masculinity should be seen as a configuration of practices and discourses that different youths embody in different ways and to different degrees. These discourses and practices are evident cross-culturally and are very society-specific where men and women are assigned specific attributes, characteristics, and expectations. A guy by the name of Cornell has put forward several masculinity models present in Western societies, especially in relation to understanding the concept of hegemony. So when we talk about masculinities, we talk about different types. We talk about he hegemonic, or dominating form of masculinity, and all other forms are subordinate masculinities, and we see as practitioners, as educators, we see that played out in the schools. Conan makes a point that in any given society, there exists a hegemonic form of masculinity with all other forms, including women and children, being accorded subordinate status. It is equally important to know that when writers refer to hegemonic models of masculinity, 
they most, invari most invariably refer to heterosexuality and is decidedly homophobic. The boundaries within which the various models operate are in a constant state of flux and as such always need to be revised. It is important to note that men and women as gendered beings do not constitute a standalone category but intersex with sexual orientation, race, and class. So, okay. So I'll have to read all the slides unless it goes back up. So we'll see. All right. So, masculine and gender said that intersex gender the sex with sexual orientation, race, and class, which in turn produce various types of unequal access to power, privilege, a word which to which I return late, to later and resources. Those who have been the recipient of privilege often see all of their gendered benefits as normative. Caribbean masculinity is from a, let's look at a cross-cultural perspective. Caribbean boys and men as part of the universal order of men have not been immune to the gendering that is specific to the region. Although Caribbean masculinities have common denominators with other Western influenced masculinities, they do in fact have their own developmental history. And as such, as with all other models of masculinity, are in, in a state of flux amidst rapidly changing cultural mores. One researcher by the name of Lois, Lyndon Lois, contend that Caribbean men negotiate their gender roles, embrace some of these said roles in particular ways, and just as easily reject these very roles with the attendant social penalty. In the final analysis, Men in the Caribbean define their masculinity in much the same way as men in any other part of the world. Cultural peculiarities may result in emphasis on the different dimensions of masculinity. Like other men, the exercise of power and the issue of control. When we think of masculinity and trying to define masculinity, two of the things that come to the fore are power and control. Men Masculinity that a man in power, with power, and of power. They lie at the core of the various discourses and masculinities. So the concept of masculinity is predicated on the presumption of power, which all men think they are entitled to. The binary, that was supposed to go up. Now, when we talk about masculinity, we always say that boys are like men are from Mars, Women are from Venus. That was supposed to be my other slide. And those are the binaries that we buy into when we talk about men and women. So masculinity, and by extension, manhood or manliness, is symbolized, and we always see those little symbols, the little arrow thing. Those are the astrological signs for Mars and Venus. Okay, Mars is known as the ancient god of war, which is part of the masculinist ideal construct, how men construct their masculinity, embodies the warrior image that is synonymous with masculinity. Men at the very core is essentially, man at the very core is essentially a fighter, primed for battle, for conquest. And one writer just declares that the real man, the man's man, the very exciting hero is a winning warrior, the guy on top, regardless of what he battles. So while Mars is used to symbolically represent the masculine ideal, Venus is used to represent the feminine ideal, the goddess of life, and by extension, caring and nurturance. So patriarchy, the system of patriarchy, which refers to the rule of the father, pits both genders on either side of the divide. So when we talk about the qualities that comprise the patriarchal ideal, this is aggressiveness, courage. We have to go back a bit. I'm ready for that, that's the, that's the one before. All right, lovely. Courage, physicality, self-control, Emotional reserve, men are not supposed to cry. Perseverance and endurance, competence, rationality, men are rational thinkers, we don't think with our hearts, we just all up there. Independence, self-reliance, how many of us say we are self-made man? And autonomy, individuality and sexual potency. Another critical component of the masculine side is machismo. The machismo orientation, which advocates a kind of reckless unconcern for rules embraces violence and places sexuality in a power context. The common denominators. Some researchers way back in 1976, Brandon and David, they looked at masculinities cross-culturally. And they vary cross-culturally, but they came up with four common denominators that they saw among those societies that they examined. 
And these are the four declarative statements that he put forward. No sissy stuff. That is, I'm going to talk about sissy, we talk about feminine. So a man, a man, a real man, does not display any characteristic that we associate with femininity. And when you hear boys taunting each other, you hear them in the classroom, you're a girl or what? We don't understand that. No man wants to be identified with. In fact, masculinity is defined as a flight from the feminine. It's the antithesis of femininity. The big wheel, I'm in charge. Look at me, I am man. The studio, steady, unbending. In the midst of crisis, it's all he stands tall. Okay, so they know he's in control. And give him hell, aggression. We expect a man to be aggressive, to be violent. So these are the stereotypes we built in, we build into the masculinist construct. According to these scholars, these constructs pervade boys' conceptual environment and by extension function powerfully in the socialization process. Now let's go to the Caribbean, Caribbean cosmology. Our Caribbean cosmology, we talk about, and Chavans and these guys always talk about the street versus the yard. And I heard people referring to that. The street symbolizes the, the community outside of the yard. The yard is seen as a protective barrier, okay? Where it is safe and where parents, particularly mothers, can throw an eye, a protective eye, on their children, particularly their daughters, okay? Now, Lois, he emphasized, underscores the importance of the yard as part of Caribbean cosmology. On the one hand, the yard is seen, as I said earlier on, is seen as the only place where mothers can exercise reasonable control over the socialization of their children. In essence, the yard represents a protective circle around the children, especially the daughter. On the other hand, according to Javans, the street holds one key to the socialization of the children in the community, especially boys. What he has to say, there it is. You can read it there. I've just teenagers and adults, to see how the street, the wider community, is a sort of incubator for our young men who control the street, regulates its flow of life, make it safe for some or unsafe for others. Engulf the prepubescent male only to release him, a prepubescent boy fully socialized in the values, predispositions, and behavior that leave many parents, the mother especially, at a loss as to what to do to counteract them. In the end, the male who is the target of socialization by the street which represents all of the uncontrolled public spaces outside the security and order of the yard, except schools and church, all right? The street in the Caribbean becomes a training ground in male survival skills. Ladies and gentlemen, it must be borne in mind that the ideological constructs that constitute masculinity do not come about spontaneously. That is, you're born male, but you construct your masculine identity that whole nature versus nurture debate, okay? You're born male, but you construct your masculine identity. It doesn't come about spontaneously through biological maturation, but rather is a precarious state that males must win against powerful odds. A lot of social expectations are placed on the shoulders of men. Men have it hard, all right? And furthermore, several researchers contend that a boy's separation and individuation is more perilous and difficult than a girl's within the patriarchal scheme of things. Because the patriarchy says, men are, in, men are in control, men are supposed to dominate. And when a man does not feel that he realizes what happens, all right? So we have to do a lot of gender negotiations and transformation of these gender identity ideals that have put men in a really serious situation. In the final analysis for boys, it's all about achieving their masculine identity, while for girls, it is all ascribed. The next part, and the final part of my presentation, I'll take a look at how the concept of masculinity has played out, lived out among Caribbean men, may be incompatible with the demands of schooling. Now let's look at the school, it has formal and informal aspects. The formal dimension is evident in view of the school as an institution that socializes its members, the patterns of behavior that leads to the adoption of particular values and attitudes. Peer influence, on the other hand, can be regarded as informal. At a certain time in your child's life, the boy's life, the peer group takes over. And nothing that you, as parents, can do anything to counteract that. Very, very difficult. And in schools, schools are part of the societal, that forms part of the socialization process. And all institutions have what is referred to as a gender regime, which is defined as a pattern of practices that construct various kinds of masculinities and femininities among staff and students. 
and orders them in terms of power, there's that word again, and prestige, and constructs a sexual division of labor. Boys are to do this, girls are supposed to do that. Reflect on your own, how you've organized your own household. It is within this matrix that students' gender identities are forged. They learn inter alia what is appropriate, what is valued, and that gender relationships are really about the sexual division of power and who is able to wield it, and to what extent, and with what effects. This gender identity to which I refer is constructed at all levels of the school through disciplinary practices. If you're in a mixed school, do you discipline boys and girls the same way? How do you interact with them in the classroom? Student-teacher relationships and school events. Triple threat, the crux of my presentation. Patriarchal gender ideals, which says that men are supposed to provide is that five or one? Five, okay. They assume, I'm almost there. Research conducted by several scholars has shed light on how notions of manhood may be incompatible with the demands of schooling. Boys' changing educational achievements may be linked to the fact, the perception, that given that education is becoming increasingly common ground, because men need to cover the space, what we call a gendered space, where they rule. Masculinity is conferred on men by other men. So what we call a big fancy term, homo social enactment. Their own group, their peers decide who makes the grade. Okay? So if education was once that space and women are coming into that space, then men are going to retreat. So we have to make that a space where the boys don't feel threatened, their gender identity is not threatened. So um, Increasingly common ground, boys are left with few opportunities to establish their gendered identity through education. In the past, academic excellence was largely, if not entirely, a male domain. It should be noted that the Anglophone Caribbean, however, the region is one of the few where secondary school and university enrollment of girls exceed that of boys. So we need a better than mine. As it stands, academic achievement furnishes less readily the establishment of their masculine gender identity. In contrast, fundamental biological difference means that physicality has been preserved as a way of a certain masculine difference, and the outdoors, the street, remain boys' territory. In the Caribbean, outdoor physicality seemed to have gained preeminent importance for developing a boy's identity, which, though benefiting sporting events, has attendant negative consequences. The need to prove themselves and establish their masculine gender identity has driven boys and men towards hard, physical, risk-taking, hyper-masculine, sometimes anti-social acts that include bullying, harassment, crime, and violence. In the meantime, the classroom no longer holds as much value for boys in establishing their masculine identity, which takes precedence over anything else. It is therefore less attractive for them. What we have in effect is a veritable flight from academic achievement. Now remember, not all masculinities are created equal, so this, is not a, this does not encompass all men, okay? Indeed, boys who do achieve in academic pursuits are at risk of being considered suspect by their peers and of becoming subject to gender taboos. Additionally, boys have come to realize that education is no longer the sole route to upward social mobility especially among the Afro male. We now have sports, music and entertainment, and drugs and the informal economy. Quick money, Gary was referring to that. Quick money, you need to get out to make money in keeping with the patriarchal ideal that men are supposed to be providers. Quick monetary return is what motivates a lot of boys, which ties in with, as I said, patriarchal gender ideal of man as provider. There's a lot of social value placed on males to provide for spouses and children. Furthermore, many Caribbean youths have found alternative means of survival in spite of not having formal education. I always cite the example up at the University of Case of Marshall Montano. Bright boy, nine passes, O levels at presentation. Wanted him to go on to A levels, but of course, he opted to do a music engineering course abroad, and we see how that turned out. Five minutes on stage, and you win $2 million. None of us sitting here can win, earn that kind of money in, five, in our lifetime, five minutes' time. Think about it. Dwight York at St. Augustine, Aston Villa saw him, and that was it. 
Then, and then we have girls telling boys they don't want any man with transport bag, they want man with wallets, all right? So male role models, and then real role models in communities and the media are not associated with discipline. Father De Devatai, as I said, the XXX principle, are not associated with discipline, submission to authority, and homebound activities. As I come to my last part, my, I still have five minutes, right? Yes, good. <laughs> may, may, may academic underperformance or under participation because they just fail to engage, nothing wrong with the brain, is linked to gender socialization practices, how we train our boys. So when we ask them to, we have, for five years we have them running about, go to the yard and play. I had a student who said his mother told him when he was sitting outside studying all the time, boy, go, um, go outside and play, they're reading too much. This is a mother telling the child. So after that, he couldn't, so boys have to go outside and play. So we tell them to run around for five years and then come in class and say, sit down still and don't move. We beat them for sweaty back in primary school and so on. Boys, so we, we go on the mobile and we tell them, sit still and don't move. All right, so we're confusing this. So you see the cognitive dissonance that sets in. So, uh, it's linked to gender socialization practices which are rooted in historic male gender privileging. Male privileging, we allow the boys more greater social space, greater mobility, and then we tell them, okay, strap it down, sit still. Okay, that, so boys are not socialized to be quiet, to do what they're told, to accept discipline, to complete the task. They rather say, they don't want to complete the task. They may not want to, they, to stay where they're told or meet, don't need permission for their mobility. They're allowed to make decisions earlier. They have access to more freedom than girls at an earlier age. If they behave badly, it's not unexpected. We expect that boy, or you behave like a boy. And their privileges are not necessarily earned through proven self-discipline. Girls have to sit quiet, comb their hair, do the dishes. That's one minute, right? Right. Let me wrap up. I have one paragraph left. Okay. Boys less often do tasks considered to be girls' tasks. We want our boys cooking, do the dishes. And these are things that instill discipline and order, but they don't know that. So many times parents come before you and say, he has nothing to do at home. Therein lies the problem. Give him something to do. Okay. Um, Boys are less often do tasks than the girls' tasks that include being confined to home, being absorbed at cleaning and presentation, and supervision. They are left to fend for themselves more often. In essence, the expectation that boys face, as well as the tasks they are given at home, do not prepare them for schooling, where teachers, or, teachers often reinforce gender socialization through different expectations and teaching practices for girls and boys. And at the end, at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, boys do not get the training in self-discipline necessary for academic success. In turn, maleness is asserted by resisting school and specific subjects. I will end here for now.